Thank you, Tom, for that incredibly generous introduction. Um, and thank you, Rod Kemp, John Roscombe, and others for your generosity and kindness in inviting me here. I must say it's a terrific testament to the power of ideas here in Australia that you can get this many people in a room to uh, get ideas going in this way. It's great to have Bjorn Lomborg here too. Having Bjorn Lomborg as a warm-up act is like following John Lennon. Um, <laughs> he's one of my heroes, a man of enormous courage and integrity. Uh, and Bjorn, I, I may be wrong, but I think this is the first time the skeptical environmentalist and the rational optimist have appeared on the same stage. <laughs> so it's a historic evening. It is a huge honor to give the C.D. Kemp lecture. I'm conscious of the privilege of addressing such a distinguished audience and also following in the footsteps of so many renowned speakers. And I'm a great admirer of what the IPA uh, has done and is doing, especially in standing up for freedom of speech in the press uh, and for, as has been mentioned, rational skepticism about exa exaggerated claims of climate change. On both of those issues, the UK is currently going in the wrong direction still. But I have hopes, because I think Australia is showing a lead to the world. As Tony Abbott has shown, you can get elected uh, as a climate skeptic. It's not something to be frightened of. And in rolling back the carbon tax, as the Canadians have said only this week, uh, you are setting a lesson for the world. Well, I took the opportunity to look up Charles Denton Kemp's book, Looking Forward, which has already been mentioned, published at the end of the Second World War, because John Roscombe kindly sent me a copy. And what a remarkable document it is. It reminded me very much of Hayek's Road to Serfdom with its far-sighted far, reach, far -sighted understanding of how misguided central planning would be for human prosperity in the post-war world. And it's also clear from various things that Charles Denton Kemp writes that his was still a very unfashionable view at the time. And it took real courage to make the case for free enterprise in the 1940s, just as it takes real courage, or it took real courage, to be skeptical about dangerous climate change in the early 2000s. As a parallel example, many of you may already know the story of the German finance minister Ludwig Erhard under American occupation after the Second World War. The American commander, General Lucius Clay, telephoned Erhard one day and said, my people tell me that you are thinking of lifting all rationing and price controls. My people think that's a very bad idea. Erhard replied, my people think it's a bad idea too, but I'm gonna do it tomorrow. <laughs> Germany's miraculous prosperity began from that moment. And it's a remarkable fact that Britain rationed food for four years longer than Germany after the war. Our rulers just could not understand that rationing was the cause of shortages rather than the other way around. In his book, Kemp writes, it is clearly an unsound and contradictory policy to maintain a system of private enterprise over a large area of economic activity and at the same time curtail its freedom of initiative, dampen its spirit of adventure, and remove its incentives to progress. Amen to that. It is people like Kemp that we have to thank for the fact that humanity has indeed triumphed in the succeeding 70 years, as I shall shortly detail. And if it had not been for a, new, a few lonely voices like his, central planning would have been the fate of all the world, not just half of it, and we would all be much poorer. Now, Woody Allen once said that mankind stands at a crossroads, one path leads to despair and utter hopelessness, the other to total extinction. <laughs> Let us hope we have the wisdom to choose the right path. <laughs> All too often, that is how everybody, conservative and socialist, old and young, rich and poor, speaks about the future of the planet. For the left, the world is going to hell in a handcart because of unrestrained greed. For the right, all is lost because of unrestrained government. But I'm going to argue that both are wrong and that today's prosperity and freedom 
are astonishing compared with what mankind has ever experienced before, but nothing compared with what our grandchildren could enjoy. And that free market liberals should, where possible, take a more optimistic tone. The golden age was not in the past, it is in the future. At the time that Botany Bay was first seen by Captain Cook, the living standard of the average Brit was probably about the same as that of Mozambique today. People died of starvation and disease in their tens of thousands every winter. As late as 1800, you had to work for six hours on the average wage to earn enough money to buy a candle that would burn for an hour. Today, you have to work for less than half a second on the average wage to earn enough money to switch on a lamp for an hour. Compared with almost any time in the past, human beings today are immeasurably better off. In my lifetime, as Bjorn has mentioned, life expectancy has gone up globally by about one third. Child mortality has fallen by two thirds globally. And income per head has trebled in real terms. Both the rate of poverty and the number of people in poverty are falling faster than at any time in history. And we are not only wealthier and healthier than ever before, we are happier, safer, better fed, cleverer, cleaner, kinder, freer, more peaceful, and more equal. I won't get stuck in the details, but the evidence on each of those adjectives is clear. Life satisfaction, for example, increases with wealth, both within and between countries. Death rates from storms, floods, and droughts have fallen by 98% since the 1920s. IQ is increasing in most countries, and so is participation in education. Air and water pollution are dramatically reduced in the rich world. A modern car emits less pollution at 70 mph than a parked car with the engine off in 1970 <laughs> because of leaks from the fuel tank. People are giving more to charity as a proportion of income than ever before. More people live in democracies and fewer in autocracies than at any time in history. Fewer people died in warfare in the first decade of this century than in any other decade since the early 1940s. And people in poor countries are getting rich much faster than people in rich countries are getting rich, which is closing the global gap between rich and poor, especially since the recession. Now, maybe these trends will not continue. Maybe we stand at a turning point. Many people think so, but they've always thought so. What I call turning point-itis is the belief that your generation is the one that will see things starting to get worse, and it goes back all the way to ancient Greece. Here's the historian and politician Lord Macaulay in 1830 railing against a pessimist. We cannot absolutely prove that those are in error who say society has reached a turning point and that we have seen our best days, but so said all who came before us and with just as much apparent reason. On what principle is it that with nothing but improvement behind us, we are to expect nothing but deterioration before us? He was fed up with the turning point mob even then. <laughs> Global pessimism was a view that I used to share. When I was a student in the 1970s, the grown-ups promised me an unbroken misery in the future. They said population explosion was unstoppable, mass famine was imminent, a cancer epidemic caused by chemicals in the environment was going to shorten lifespan, the Sahara was advancing at a mile a year, the ice age was returning, the oil was running out, air pollution was choking us, and a nuclear winter would finish me off. By the time I was 21 years old, I realized that nobody had ever said anything optimistic to me about the future of the planet and its people, at least not that I could recall. Doom was certain. Here's a quote from an article written by two young men in 1971, one of whom is now President Obama's science advisor. 
while the other went on to win a genius award from the MacArthur Foundation, John Holdren and Paul Ehrlich. We are not, of course, optimistic about our chances of success. Some form of eco-catastrophe, if not thermonuclear war, seems almost certain to overtake us before the end of the 20th century. Well, it didn't happen. The next two decades, in the 70s and 80s and 90s, were just as bad. Acid rain was going to devastate forests. The loss of ozone layer was going to fry us. Sperm counts were falling. <laughs> Swine flu, bird flu, and the Ebola virus were going to wipe us out. In 1992, the United Nations Earth Summit in Rio de Janeiro opened its agenda for the 21st century with the words, humanity stands at a defining moment in history. There's that turning point again. We are confronted with a perpetuation of disparities between and within nations, a worsening of poverty, hunger, ill health, and illiteracy, and the continuing deterioration of the ecosystems on which we depend for our well-being. Actually, poverty, hunger, ill health, and illiteracy were already retreating fast, and the improvement was about to accelerate. By the 1990s, even I had begun to notice that this terrible future was not all that bad. In fact, every single one of the dooms that I had been threatened with had proved either false or exaggerated. The population explosion was slowing down. Famine had largely been conquered, except in war-torn tyrannies. India was exporting food. Cancer rates were falling, not rising, when adjusted for age. The Sahel was getting greener. The climate was warming gently. Oil was abundant. Air pollution was falling fast. Nuclear disarmament was proceeding apace. Forests were thriving. Sperm counts had not fallen. <laughs> and above all, prosperity and freedom were advancing at the expense of poverty and tyranny. As Bjorn Lomborg and 21 other top economists have recently shown in their new book, which he mentioned, the cost of poor health at the outset of the 20th century was an astounding 32% of global GDP. Today, it's down to about 11%, and by 2050, it will be half that. The cost of pollution, gender inequality, and many of the other barnacles on the hull of human progress have also been falling fast. Even climate change is currently benefiting the world, as Bjorn mentioned, more than it is harming it, and will continue to do so for the next seven decades, as documented by Professor Richard Toll. Yet, if anything, despite the failure of their predictions, the pessimists only grew more certain, shrill, and apocalyptic in the 1990s and 2000s. We were facing the end of nature, the coming anarchy, a stolen future, our final century, and a climate catastrophe. By the way, if I really wanted to write a bestseller, Bjorn, if we really wanted to write a bestseller, we should write a pessimistic one. We would sell far more copies. Why, I began to wonder, did the failure of the previous predictions have so little impact on this litany? Well, I soon found out one reason. Like others who've tried to draw attention to the improving living standards, notably Julian Simon and Bjorn, I was subject to a sustained campaign of vilification by the pessimists once I started voicing doubts about the apocalypse. They just cannot bear to let an optimistic view be heard. They think it's complacent, conservative, callous, and crackpot. Good news is no news. Bad news sells newspapers and brings in donations. Optimists rock the boat. John Stuart Mill once wrote, I have observed that not the man who hopes when others despair, but the man who despairs when others hope is admired by a large class of persons as a sage. <laughs> it's worth reflecting on the etymology of the word optimist. First coined by Voltaire to ridicule Leibniz's philosophy of theodicy, it originally meant almost the opposite of what it means today. It meant somebody who believes that the world is perfect because God made it. If bad things happen, so says Dr. Pangloss in Candide, then they must really be for the best. 
If tens of thousands of people die in an earthquake in Lisbon, well, God must have decided to punish the wicked citizens of Lisbon in order to improve the world. Today, it's the pessimists, especially the green ones, who think that the world is perfect and cannot be improved. They call it the precautionary principle, a rule that a friend of mine, Ron Bailey, defines as, let's not try anything for the first time. So we do risk analysis of genetically modified food or fracking, but we never do benefit analysis. It's they who are the complacent Panglossian ones, I would argue. Well, I'm an optimist in a very different sense from that. The world is much better than it once was, but it's a veil of tears compared with what it could be. Of course, the turning point pessimists could one day be right. To extrapolate a benign trend from the past into the future is perhaps to be like the man who falls out of the skyscraper and shouts as he passes the second floor, so far, so good. <laughs> or as I think you say here in Australia, today's rooster is tomorrow's feather duster. Well, my optimism is not based on the fact that things turned out better than expected. It's based on why they turned out better than expected. The answer to that question is very simple. Exchange and specialization. The miracle of economic growth is driven by trade. Intercontinental, international, intercity, intervillage, interpersonal trade. You do what you're good at, somebody else does what he's good at, and you swap. You're both better off, and you're both working for each other. Thomas Sutcliffe Mort, the wool trader who began exporting frozen mutton from Sydney in 1874, put it rather well. He said, the time has arrived when the various portions of the earth will each give forth their products for the use of each and of all. The overabundance in one country will make up for the deficiency of another. Science has drawn aside the veil and invention has done the rest. I'm grateful, by the way, to Nick Cater's fine book, The Lucky Culture, for that quote. I don't know where Nick is, but it's a wonderful book. <laughs> Incidentally, you'll often hear people argue that international trade has made us more precarious and vulnerable. But this is the wrong way round. One reason that famine is now so rare is that thanks to global trade in food, it would take harvest failures on all continents simultaneously to produce global famine, and that's not going to happen. The benefits of trade, already mostly obvious to Adam Smith in 1776 and to David Ricardo in 1817, are blindingly so today. Living standards rise in places that open themselves up to world trade. The ancient Phoenicians, the classical Greeks, the Ashokan Indians, the Song Chinese, the Abbasid Arabians, Renaissance Italians, 17th century Dutch, Victorian British, 1960s Japanese, 1970s Hong Kong, Japan, Hong Kong Chinese, and the 2000s Brazilians and in Indians. They all got rich through open, free trade. Every place that has tried a closed approach to growth, from Ming China to modern North Korea, from Nehru's India to Hoksha's Albania, has stagnated or gone backwards. And by the way, what brings prosperity to a halt is usually one of two things, bureaucracy and superstition. It was the stifling imperial bureaucracy of the Ming emperors that turned China from the richest to the poorest country on earth. The Mao emperor didn't help either. It was suffocating superstition that shut down innovation in the Arabian Empire and it was a bit of both that brought Rome to its knees. Need I spell out the modern parallels? The Ming mandarins of Brussels, the superstitious intolerance, <laughs> the superstitious intolerance of GM crops or fracking from the militant mullahs of the green movement. The connection between trade and innovation goes right back to the old Stone Age. Tasmania became an island 10,000 years ago when sea level rose at the end of the Ice Age. 
The people on Tasmania not only failed to share in innovations that occurred after that date on the mainland, they never got the boomerang, for example, they actually gave up some of the technologies they had in the succeeding 10,000 years. Bone tools, for instance, disappeared around 3,500 years ago in Tasmania. The same did not happen to the inhabitants of Tierra del Fuego, an even more inhospitable island at similar size and slightly higher latitude. So the simplification of the Tasmanian toolkit had nothing to do with diet or climate. As the anthropologist Joe Henrik has concluded, it was caused by isolation, by lack of trade. Fuegians traded with mainland South Americans across the narrow Magellan Strait as Tasmanians could not trade across the much wider Bass Strait. So if Wagians could get objects and ideas from other people, they did not have to rely on their own resources. Tasmanians were stuck with self-sufficiency, with subsistence. The parallel with North Korea is striking. It is exchange that drives innovation. We can see this right from the start of human history more than 100,000 years ago, when the first hints of trade begin to appear in Africa, objects moving inland long distances from the sea. The result is technological diversification. Wherever we see trade, we see innovation. In trading, we specialize. In specializing, we innovate. And in trading and specializing, we combine ideas to make new ideas. Innovation consists almost entirely of combining ideas. Every technology you think of is a combination of existing technologies, as Brian Arthur has argued. My favorite example is the pill camera, which takes a picture of your insides on the way through. It came about after a conversation between a gastroenterologist and a guided missile designer. <laughs> now, I'm a biologist by training, and one of the things that most fascinates me is the parallel between evolution by natural selection and the economics of markets. Both are about spontaneous order, about the emergence, undesigned and unbidden from above, of complex, highly organized systems. Adam Smith and Charles Darwin were essentially describing two manifestations of the same phenomenon. Ecosystems and economies are both examples of spontaneous uh, order. Biological evolution is accelerated and made cumulative by sex, by the mixing of genes. This enables an individual to get good genetic ideas from anywhere in the species and bring them together, rather than just from its own direct maternal lineage. And there's a direct parallel here with the role that trade plays in economic and cultural evolution. Before trade, you had to invent things yourself. After trade, you can get good ideas from anywhere in the world. Trade has the same impact on culture, therefore, as sex had on biology. Innovation is indeed evolutionary. It's incremental, inevitable, inexorable. It's driven by the exchange of ideas. It's not the result of lonely geniuses in ivory towers thinking outside the box. It's a bottom-up, not a top-down process, driven by practical people with problems to solve. They sometimes get the people in ivory towers to solve them for them, but it's, that's where it's coming from. And that, essentially, is why I'm an optimist, because I see no sign of the exchange of ideas ceasing. Indeed, it's accelerating. The internet means that two ideas can meet and mate and have a baby idea faster than ever before. This is the greatest example of collaboration in the world. You'll often hear critics argue that those who believe in free enterprise worship selfishness and individualism. And I think that criticism is wildly, madly, 180 degrees wrong. There is not a single thing in my possession here today the clothes I'm wearing, the things in my pockets, the thoughts in my head, that was even made by one person, let alone by me. Everything is the product of cooperation, often among strangers. Everything is cumulative and collaborative, 
Where's the selfishness in that? Wherever the ways of men are gentle, there is commerce. And wherever there is commerce, the ways of men are gentle, as observed Charles Baron de Montesquieu. Voltaire, when he was in exile in London, wrote in one of his letters, go into the London Stock Exchange, a more respectable place than any court, and you will see representatives from all nations gathered together for the utility of men. Here, Jew, Mohammedan, and Christian deal with each other as though they were all of the same faith and only apply the word infidel to people who go bankrupt. <laughs> Here, the Presbyterian trusts the Anabaptist and the Anglican accepts a promise from the Quaker. David Hume thought that commerce was rather favorable to liberty and has a natural tendency to preserve, if not produce, a free government, and that nothing is more favorable to the rise of politeness and learning than a number of neighboring and independent states connected together by commerce and policy. The evidence in favor of Hume's hypothesis is accumulating steadily. As Steven Pinker documents in his book, The Better Angels of Our Nature, the best explanation of the remarkable decline in warfare in recent decades is the spread of trade, even more than the spread of democracy. It's no accident that culture flowers in places where trade is free. Think of Socrates in Athens, Leonardo in Florence, Rembrandt in Amsterdam. In a fascinating series of experiments, the anthropologist Joe Henrik and his colleagues showed that people play ultimatum games more selfishly in more isolated and self-sufficient hunter-gatherer societies and less selfishly in more market-integrated small-scale societies. So as Deirdre McCloskey reminds us, we must not slip into apologizing for markets, for saying that they are necessary despite their cruelties. We should embrace them precisely because they make people less selfish and they make life more collaborative, less individualistic. The entire drift of human history has been to make us less self-sufficient, more dependent on, on others to provide what we consume, and on others to consume what we provide. We become more specialized as producers and more diversified as consumers. That's the very definition of prosperity. So it's time to reclaim the word collectivism from the statists on the left. The whole point of the market is that it does indeed collectivize society, but from the bottom up, not the top down. We surely know by now, after endless experiments, that a powerful state encourages selfishness. That's the very gist of public choice theory. I don't want to belabor the point, but let me make one more example. The shirt on my back is the work of thousands of people. A man grew coffee in Brazil to be drunk by an American working in a fertilizer factory whose fertilizer would be used by a woman in a cotton field in India whose cotton would be spun and woven in a factory in Vietnam to a design that was drawn up in London, the shirt then being shipped across the world in a ship driven by a Filipino using oil extracted by an Arabian to a shopkeeper in Newcastle, which is where I bought the shirt. <laughs> you get the point. All of these people collaborated with each other and with me in the project of supplying me with a shirt. And it cost me about three hours of work on the average wage. And yet, of course, not one of these people knew how to make a shirt. As Leonard Reed so famously pointed out in his wonderful essay, I Pencil, in 1958. Because the man who stitched the shirt didn't know how to grow cotton or vice versa. The magnificent complexity of the system was unplanned and inside nobody's head. So let's have no more talk about the callous unkindness of the free market. It's the kindest system of human organization ever devised for raising people out of poverty, for equalizing their opportunities, for suppressing warfare, for encouraging culture, and for causing people to treat strangers as honorary friends. The market isn't selfish, and it isn't conservative either. It's all about change. It's the best way of upending the social order yet devised. 
It was free enterprise in the 1960s that liberated women from domestic drudgery, that gave black people the economic power to demand civil rights, that put teenagers in charge of setting cultural trends. Another thing, or maybe you don't like that so much, but anyway. <laughs> Another thing market-driven innovation also isn't, in my view, is capitalist. To me, that word means big business raising large war chests of capital to dominate sectors, usually with subsidies or government regulatory help in erecting barriers to entry. Some people call that crony capitalism, but I'm not sure the adjective is even necessary. The more I see of the inside of government as a new member of the House of Lords, the more I see how crony most capitalism is, how legislators are constantly being lobbied and how they respond by urging privileges for producers at the expense of consume consumers. The other day in Parliament, we were debating energy and colleague after colleague started banging on about the jobs that could be created in the construction and maintenance of wind farms. I stood up and said, I thought we built power stations for the people who use the electricity, not for those who make the power station. If we want to employ as many people in making energy as possible, let's do it with millions of people on exercise bicycles. <laughs> So the market is not capitalism. If anything, it's the antidote to capitalism. It's the process that hunts down abnormal profits and cuts them back, that runs monopolies out of town, that rewards the nimble insurgent, not the comfortable fat cat. And it's always on the side of the consumer rather than the producer. So these days, I sometimes describe myself as a free market anti-capitalist. <laughs> Gets attention, anyway. There is one final hurdle that I have to overcome if I want to persuade you of an optimistic future. And that is to explode the myth that economic growth means the using up of resources. It's an article of faith among Greens that growth comes from using more metal, more land, more energy, more plastics, more ecosystems. And this idea goes back particularly to Limits to Growth, the book that was published 40 years ago and sold 12 million copies. And it's plain wrong. Innovation often means using less. We use less energy to produce the same increment in human welfare as we did 50 years ago. And we burn half as much carbon per unit of GDP these days. We use less steel in our buildings, less petrol in our cars, less wood in our houses, less paper in our offices. We use less electricity to produce the same amount of light from a compact fluorescent bulb as we did from an incandescent bulb and we'll soon even use, use even less when we switch to light-emitting diodes. The whole point of growth is to do more with less. The most striking example of this is land. Jesse Orzabel and his colleagues at Rockefeller University have calculated that humankind needs 65% less land on average to produce the same amount of food as we needed 50 years ago. That's largely because of artificial fertilizers, but also pesticides, better varieties, and tractors replacing horses, freeing up more land from growing hay. Indeed, Elzebel calculates that even if you assume fairly generous population growth and a lot of meat eating as people get richer, we may already have passed peak farmland, or rather we would have done if we hadn't gone in for biofuels. That is to say, we can return more land to nature every year on a global scale. We've already started reforesting and releasing land for nature in large parts of the rich world. Once Africa really gets access to agricultural fertilizer, this land sparing could happen really quite rapidly. The deceleration of population growth is another example of growth as shrinkage. The richer people get, the fewer babies they have. Once you stop kids dying, people plan smaller families. This demographic transition has happened all over the world. In Europe first, then, then North America, then Asia, then Latin America, and now increasingly in Africa. The rate of growth of world population has halved in my lifetime, and it's headed for zero in about 2070 or 2080. The most striking of all the beneficial trends, and the one that I wrote about in the Spectator article that Tom uh, 
waved at you, is the greening of the globe. As Dr. Ranga Mainani of Boston University has documented, using 30 years of satellite data, 31% of the global vegetated area of the planet has become greener, and just 3% has become less green. This translates into a 14% increase in the productivity of ecosystems and has been observed in all vegetation types since 1981. Dr. Randall Donahue and colleagues at the CSIRO Land and Water Department in Canberra have also analyzed satellite data and found that greening is clearly attributed, at least in part, to the carbon dioxide fertilization effect. Greening is especially pronounced in dry areas like the Sahel region of Africa and Western Australia, where satellites show a big increase in vegetation since, in green vegetation since the 1970s because there's more carbon dioxide in the air so the plants waste less water in absorbing it. In other words, fossil fuels are making the earth greener. On that happy and provocative note, I'll end.